22nd of Bahman, the day that changed Iran. The day that years of intellectual foundation laying and months of popular protest finally proved fruitful. The 11th of February, the day of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Millions were on the street and millions more across the world watched as the Shah, a strong US ally and his monarchy, seen as Israel and America's most important friend in the region, collapsed. The downfall of the Western-backed regime sent shockwaves throughout the region and the world. It was unheard of, people and their religious beliefs fueling a revolution headed by a 70-year-old Ayatollah who rejected Western secularism and instead promoted religious foundations for society and politics. Ayatollah Khomeini was feared by the West but loved in Iran. Millions upon millions of Iranians turned out for his return. Organizers were so overwhelmed as the crowd surrounded his motorcade that in the end he had to be airlifted home. The masses looked to him as the political leader of the revolution, a man who had united the spectrum of political parties under his rule. But most importantly, he was the spiritual leader of the revolution. The mix of politics and Islam, or as Iranians saw it, putting Islam back in its rightful place at the hearts of politics, was poignant. The creation of the Islamic Republic was a milestone. It enshrined the principles of both religious leadership, Velayat al and a publicly elected government and president. This new politics was, depending on how you look at it, misunderstood, feared, even demonized by the West. They struggled to contain it, resorting to attacking it, diplomatically and otherwise. Before the revolution, the Shah ruled Iran. It was a monarchy he led with an iron fist, an autocracy that was tightening by the day and suffocating the people. The country had a nearly 3,000-year history of monarchic rule. The Shah saw himself as the continuation of that age-old history and therefore that he had a rightful inheritance to rule. I was wondering if you could explain the need for uh, what most people call an absolute monarchy at this stage in, Iran. in Iran's development. Yes. The country has been used to have a monarch for 3,000 years. So it's not a, a pill that you are forcing in their mouth. They take it as a very normal thing. Whether the pill was being forced on them or whether they were taking it out of the habit of thousands of years of history didn't mean that Iranians were taking that pill out of choice. An overwhelming majority of Iranians were traditional and religious people, but the Shah did not represent them. He had strong ties with the West and with fervor pursued a policy of westernization for the country that he saw as the only path to modernization. But in reality, he led the country as a dictator and was seen as a US puppet leader bowing to Washington's every demand. That view was cemented on October 3, 1964, when Iran's parliament passed a status of forces agreement with America. The law gave any American in Iran indefinite immunity inside the country. There was an outcry among the religious leaders, most famously by Imam Khomeini, who was repeatedly arrested over his speeches against the Shah and America. The speeches were religiously charged and often caused mass protests. He was finally exiled in 1964, and this was the beginning of a movement that almost 15 years later would see Khomeini return to Iran and the Islamic Revolution see victory. Only then did America start to assess the new realities taking shape. One can equally well say that one of the problems the Shah had was that he was too supportive of the United States. And he's being attacked today in his own country for selling oil to Israel, for not using oil for political uh, pressures, for having uh, attempted to defend himself uh, by buying for cash the weapons that he needed. That is one of the major criticisms that is made of him. Uh, it was very helpful to American administrations for 38 years uh, to have a ruler who in every crisis of the Middle East 
was on our side about a country that we never had to worry when there was a crisis in the Middle East. In fact, the issue of arms and the financial and political relationship with America under the Shah was one of the first issues Imam Khomeini addressed on his return home. تمام نفت ما را به غیر دادن به آمریکا و غیر از آمریکا دادن اونی که به آمریکا دادن عوض چی گرفتن عوض یک اسلحه‌ای برای پایگاه درست کردن برای آقای امریکا ما هم نفت دادیم و هم پایگاه برای اونا درست کردیم The Islamic Revolution of Iran had a number of unique features Its success is seen as the result of an equation made of three parts, the people, Islam, and the leadership of Khomeini. Without these three components, the revolution would never have taken place and would not have been able to be as strong and uprooting as it was. It radically changed the makeup of the country. But this was because it had a strong leadership under Imam Khomeini, who was both a political and a religious figure, and because it had the massive popular support of the people. One thing that made Iran different to other revolutions was that it had a religious foundation. It is an aspect that is still important in Iran today. We travel to the city of Qom to speak to Nasser Saqqa Bidiyar, university professor and advisor to Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. We look at the movement of the prophets of God as one movement. and we consider the Islamic revolution as the continuation of that movement. Therefore, the ideology of this revolution is the same ideology of the prophets of God. One of the main slogans of the Islamic revolution was of independence. Iran wanted to be independent from the American influence so powerful under the rule of the Shah. When Imam Khomeini started his movement, on one side was the grand monarchy of the Shah with all its power, backed by all the might of America, and on the other, Khomeini. We met with Sayyid Hamid Rouhani at the Iranian Contemporary Historical Research Institute. He was one of Imam Khomeini's companions who went into exile with him. He described that until the presence of Khomeini on the political scene, it was unheard of for a movement to be making strides independently without the support, overt or covert, of an outside power player. Modern Najaf ke budim gahi be in دفاتر سازمان های آزادی بخش در عراق در لبنان در سوریه می رفتیم کتاب می بردیم اعلامی می بردیم از اونا نشریه می گرفتیم ارتباطاتی داشتیم اولین سوالی که از ما می کردن این بود که شما در ایران در مبارزاتون علیه شاه از کمک کدام یک از این ابرقدرت ها برخوردارید وقتی من جواب می دادم که ما جز به اتکاب ملتمون به هیچ قدرت خارجی اتکا نداریم یا باور نمی کردم یا فکر می کردم من دارم دروغ می گم یه پوسخندی می زدن در لبنان یادم هست که یکی از رهبران یک گروه ماویستی بود از من همین سوال رو کرد وقتی این جواب دادم با یک لحن تلخی گفت شما اصلا سیاست چیزی نفهمیدید یعنی اصلا مسئله وابستگی به یک قدرت خارجی به عنوان یک اصل مسلم تلقی می شد The desire for an Islamic society and the idea of independence, along with the leadership of Imam Khomeini and the people's backing, led to a 3,000-year-old monarchy to collapse. As the world's media watched the Shah's downfall and the rise of an Islamic revolution, Iran was the hot topic of the day, creating headlines, speculation and controversy. How one man can command such adoration. How so many people can believe that this frail old priest holds all the answers to Iran's problems. But even in those early days, with the seeds of animosity for the new Iran already sown, the mainstream media was still often enthralled by Imam Khomeini and his words. If you remember Time magazine and many other 
leading magazines and newspapers and TV shows, etc. during that period, even though they hated the Iranian revolution, they regarded uh, Imam Khomeini as a leading figure, not only for Iran, but one of the leading figures of the, uh, of the century. So uh, you cannot separate the Iranian revolution from the role of Khomeini. It's, uh, it's one. It's one. The Iranian revolution wasn't just a change of powerhouses or political players. It was a complete upheaval and uprooting of a country. Not just its politics, but its view of politics and the world. Some say that this aspect of the revolution, the visionary ideological depths of it, are fundamentally misunderstood by the West, and their disregard of this matter impacts how they understand and view Iran. چون ببینید تو حوزه تفکر سیاسی غرب انقلاب یک یک هیجان ناگهانی و نتایجش هم سقوط فقط سیستم سیاسیه فقط سقوط یعنی جابجایی قدرت بیش از هر چیز نمود انقلاب تو جابجایی قدرت ولی در تفکرات ما اینجوری نیست انقلاب یک تداوم تاریخیه یک حرکتی در یک مقطع برای اینکه فضا عوض بشه ببینید نوع نگاه ما عوض بشه نه نوع سیستم سیاسی ما عوض بشه The Islamic aspect of the revolution was probably the biggest effect on regional countries where the populations were predominantly Muslim Middle East affairs expert Said Vahid Hosseini says at first, religious leaders looked at the Islamic revolution and its developments with keen interest and sometimes skepticism as they waited to see whether Islam can provide a foundation for ruling a country in the 20th century. بسیاری از کشور اسلامی در ابتدا نسبت به امام و ایده های امام به عنوان اینکه امام خمینی یک کشور به اصطلاح به عنوان اسلامی و حاکمیت سیاسی را میخواه و میخواه که به حاکمیت برسانه برایشان خیلی تعجب برانگیز بود و حتی ناراحت کننده بود اما امام تانست که این فکر و این تزه در سطح بهملی و جهان معرفی بکنه The people, meanwhile, were inspired and invigorated as they saw their brothers and sisters in faith in Iran achieve what seemed impossible only months earlier. Historians say it kick-started a host of movements right across the region, some of them more successful than others. از همون اوان سال 1158 خیزش های اسلامی در بحرین، مصر، در بین فلسطینی ها و منطقه آغاز شد خب در منفعل شده بود کشورهای منطقه منفعل شده بودند This fusing of Islam and politics in the modern world or going back to the roots of Islam as providing regulation for all parts of life including politics changed the dynamics and dialogue on the international arena Many say that the Islamic revolution in Iran help change political dialogue from excluding religion to accepting that it can provide logical and legitimate solutions to world problems. Islam siyasi, Islam inqilabi, ba har tabir digari ki gofte beshabad, imruz da sahne binumari naqsha farine. Imruz sazmani belan miyad va kongre adyan bargazar mikone. Va miyad adyan biyan bara hal masail bashariyat be ma kumak konan. امروز یونسکو میاد میگه گذشتی که دوران تضاد علم و دین نه دین برای اداره جامعه بشر حرف داره بنابراین خیلی مسائل عوض شده مدارس دینی را This spiritual or religious revolution was not just being seen in politics or just among Muslims David Haim, the executive editor of the Christian Century, has said that since the 1980s, people have gone after spirituality to build the framework of their day-to-day lives, and that there's been a surge in TV and films based on spirituality, religion, angels, all of which get the most viewers. He says there's also been an increased acceptance of religion in political dialogue. Historian Mozaffar Namdar says when it comes to politics in Islam, many countries have implemented Islamic aspects to their politics or had an Islamic flavor to it, 
But there has been no country other than Iran that has attempted to base its whole political framework on Islamic law and ethics. من به ندرت حس می کنم مطالعات خودم میگه در حوزه سیاست ما به ندرت میتونیم کشوری رو پیدا کنیم که تمام ساختار سیاسی اجتماعیش نهادهای حقوقیش و اینها بر مباید بر مبنای قوانین اسلامی شکل گرفته باشه ممکنه درش قوانین اسلامی حضور داشته باشه مثلا در کشور پاکستان بسیاری از نهادهای حقوقیش به دلیل اینکه بنیانگذارای اصلیش مسلمان بودند خوب وجود داره اما ببینید هیچ کسی اون بستر رو اون سیستم رو با تمام قواعد و قوانین و ساختارش نمیتونه تصور کنه که اسلامیه شاید تنها کشور ایران باشه که بعد از انقلاب این وضعیت درش اتفاق افتاده One of the countries that faced a social and political crisis after the Iranian revolution was neighboring Turkey For many people who were pursuing socialist-based models for reform, suddenly a workable Islamic model came to light, one that had been more successful in overthrowing a Western-influenced autocratic regime better than anything else. The Islamic kinship Turks felt with their Iranian counterparts also spurred this sentiment. In Turkey, we spoke with historian Yavuz Selim Kort, who told us how important the Iranian revolution was for the people of the region and specifically Turkey and how it became an example to follow. According to our understanding, uh, Iran's revolution in the 20th century uh, was the most important revolution after the French revolution in 18th century. Uh, here, the people in Iran, uh, they had a struggle against uh, the imperialists and their tools. Their, Uh, cooperators in their country. So uh, after this revolution completed and succeeded, uh, people in the region, they had confidence uh, and uh, they believed that they can do the same. Two years after the Iranian revolution on the 12th of September 1980, there was a Turkish coup d'etat headed by Chief of General Staff General Kanan Evren. During those years, in line with the Carter Doctrine that the U.S. would use military force to defend its national interests in the Persian Gulf, it pumped billions of dollars into Turkey's military. Meanwhile, a popular uprising in Turkey was brewing. Some experts say that in fact the coup d'etat was a diversion because of U.S. and Turkish fears that Turkey could become like Iran, and that would have damaging effects on U.S. control in the region. It's not coincidence. On 6th of uh, uh, September 1980, there was a great meeting uh, protest uh, in Konya. It was about Jerusalem, Kudus uh, meeting. And just six days after this meeting, uh, a state coup uh, we are witnessing, uh, made by Kenan Evren. And later on, in some of his memories, he said, we had to make uh, the uh, coup uh, because The Islamic movement uh, increased so much. He admitted these, especially just after the Iranian revolution. They were uh, very scared that this revolution will be import, uh, exported to the other countries. There were other preventative actions being taken by worried dictators across the region. In Iraq, for example, Saddam Hussein, who in those days was a U.S. ally and heavily funded by Washington, is said to have launched a campaign to stem any possible uprising inspired by the Iranian revolution. Grand Ayatollah Mohammad Baghir Saad, an Iraqi Shia cleric, a philosopher and founder of the Islamic Dawah party, was assassinated, as were others. The U.S. would wage a war on Saddam in years to come, but in those years they supported and even took part in his actions. یعنی اولی شد صدام به شهادت رسون دومی و امریکایی و انگلیس ها اولین چهری که توان رهبری و راهبری و داشت شهید آیت الله سید محمد باقر صدر بود که در همون سال 58 به صلا صدام احساس خطر کرد که اینجا آبستن یک انقلاب و یک حرکت خوب ایشون و ادهی ای از مراجع و علما رو به شهادت رسون دومین چهره ای که در دوران سقوط صدام انتظار می رفت رهبری عملی و به دست بگیره آیت الله سید محمد باقر حکیم بود که واقعا توانمند بود 
خب اون هم به دست همین عوامل امریکایی ها و اروپایی ها به شهادت میرسه In other countries like in Yemen, uprisings after the Iranian revolution were quickly and sometimes violently stemmed. But the Islamic ideology of resistance against tyranny and oppression led by the Iranian revolution did spread and can today be seen in movements like Lebanon's resistance, Hezbollah, headed by Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, and even non-Shia movements like the Palestinian Hamas party. These groups are linked by their religious ideas of resistance against oppression and have fundamentally changed the balance of the region over the last few decades. Iran has been active in promoting causes it sees as resulting from tyranny, such as the Palestinian cause. Imam Khomeini announced International Qots Day, a day of rallies across the world to support Palestinians and denounce Zionism. Muslims hope that the day of Qots will be strong. و در همه ممالک اسلامی در روز قدس در روز جمعه آخر ماه مبارک تظاهر کنند مجالس داشته باشند محافل داشته باشند مسجد داشته باشند در مساجد فریاد بزنند وقتی یک میلیارد جمعیت فریاد کرد اسرائیل نمیتوند از همون فریادش میترسد So is Iran actively exporting its revolution? Well, experts say that this assessment is not accurate, that without popular support, none of the movements outside of Iran could have gained momentum. It's more likely, they say, that the Islamic revolution only inspired other people to take their own steps towards independence and freedom. In the world, for example, the Islamic government wants to make its own government. It's a mistake. خیلی هم غلطه ولی تو مردمی نخوان هیچ کاری نمیشه کرد شما ملاحظه کنید مثلا مثال فلسطین رو شما در نظر بگیرید قضیه فلسطین بالاخره قبل از انقلاب اسلامی هم سی سال جریان داشت ولی عملا به جایی نرسید همین ملت بعد از پیروزی انقلاب آمدن و با ایمان به گفتمان انقلاب اسلامی و ویژگی های این انقلاب الگو قرار دادن رو حرکت شروع, شروع کردن رو رفتن جلو امروز دشمنان ما به سراحت دارن میگن که فلسطین راه ایران رو رفته و به اینجا رسیده So the assessment is that the Iranian revolution was sparked by an equation of the people, leadership and Islam It was the most successful and uprooting revolution in the region and afterwards, inspired by what happened in Iran people in the region also became more politically active and there were similar movements, to lesser and higher degrees, some more successful than others. All this changed the equation of the region. However, as America and Israel lost control of Iran as a strategic country and ally, it emplaced other autocratic leaders to stem the tide of popular uprising and maintain control of the region. That was the status quo for decades. The new players in the region, Iran, the resistance in countries like Lebanon and Palestine, and countries like Syria on the one side, and the status quo hegemonic powers on the other, trying to maintain control. All that, though, seemed to unravel when Tunisia happened. In one word, uh, we have become a role model for the Muslim countries and also all the oppressed countries of the world. That is the thing. So uh, Tunisia just was a start. Uh, it was a, uh, a trigger for starting uh, the movement in people who were ready uh, because they were awakened. What was the cause of their awakening? I think that was Islamic revolution. Tunisia's uprising has also spread and we are witnessing Egyptian people struggling against Hosni Mubarak, a figure experts have likened to the Shah because of his autocratic rule and friendship with America. In fact, we hear similar rhetoric from Barack Obama as we did from American officials three decades ago about Iran. Many things have changed over the years and, as the Iranian leadership has reiterated, It's not trying to influence or take over these movements, but the roots of this decades-long struggle of people in the Middle East and Africa, Muslim and non-Muslim, can be found in the roots of the Islamic revolution of Iran. 
a movement that uprooted a tyrannical leader and demanded an independence it has maintained for three decades. The waves of this beginning were seen just after the revolution, in the decades since, and again the waves of those calls are being heard now. Calls for an independence and freedom that are rooted in Islam. This movement and uprising continues.